Most salmon farms in British Columbia, as in other producing countries, raise Atlantic salmon, a different species than Pacific that have been bred to grow faster and to live in floating net cages, typically located in near shore waters. One reason critics believe the farms threaten wild salmon is because due to storm damage or human error, farmed fish have at times escaped their net cages in large numbers. Over the last decade, it's estimated that well over one million salmon have escaped their pens in British Columbia and Washington. There are concerns that endangered Pacific populations could be threatened if their spawning grounds are invaded by the farmed fish that escaped their pens. Well. Since salmon aquaculture began in Norway in the 1970s, it has coped with a variety of pathogens that still challenge what has become a multi-billion dollar industry, also operating in the United Kingdom, North America, and Chile. One of the worst early episodes occurred in 1975, when a deadly parasite was spread from salmon farms to wild salmon in over 38 rivers and streams. To contain the outbreak, the Norwegian government was forced to use poisons to destroy all wild fish in those watersheds. A modern farm like this here is uh, typical for the industry in British Columbia. Very heavy, very strong net, engineered anchoring. Uh, the number of salmon that have uh, escaped in British Columbia have been coming down uh, drastically uh, for the last number of years. We've relocated some of our farms. We've rebuilt all of our farms. We've invested in better net management. Our approach begins with acknowledging that there are risks, like there are for every way of farming, including fishing and every human endeavor. One of the risks which continue to challenge the industry are problems which can affect the health of farmed and wild salmon. Not only have algal blooms killed entire net cages of fish, but there are also lethal parasites and diseases which pass between the farms and the wild. In British Columbia, farms are being hard hit by a virus called sockeye disease, or IHN infectious hemopoietic necrosis. If you stand on a football field with a person with a cold, you're less likely to get that cold than if you stand in an elevator for four hours with 10 other people who are very sick with the same cold. That's the principle. The transmission potential to the wild fish is huge. You almost never see sick wild fish because they're grabbed. The seals get them, the whales get them, the birds get them. But in the farm situation, they're coddled, they're drugged, they're protected. They get it from the wild, but then they amplify it. And this is the real problem we're seeing here. With new vaccines, we've dramatically reduced the use of antibiotics. We're using less than a tenth of what we were using 10 years ago. We don't yet have a vaccine for sockeye disease. The risk of disease will never be eliminated. But what we find is that with careful monitoring and treatment as necessary, it's manageable. Another problem that salmon farmers have tried to manage are infestations of sea lice. Local biologists and fishermen say that wild salmon are being infested by lice as they migrate near salmon farms, a problem which can be especially lethal to juvenile fish. Regardless of how they're fed, the feed pellets given to salmon contain fish meal and fish oil a dietary requirement for all carnivorous fish species. Although exact conversion rates are a subject of debate, most scientists agree that for every pound of salmon farm raised, at least three pounds of wild fish must be caught in the ocean as feed, a conversion many consider to be a wasteful use of fishery resources growing ever more scarce. The world production of fish oil is something like between one and one and a half million tons per year. And that could be finished before 2015. Fish meal 
could run out uh, sometime before 2030. That is, all of the present fish meal production could at that time possibly be used for aquafeeds. There are also food safety issues involved with the fish being caught to create fish meal and oil. The contaminant level of the fish meal will reflect the contaminant load in the environment from which they came. Our challenge is to find areas where the contaminant level is low and ensure that we source fish meal and fish oil from those sources, not from polluted sources. An exhaustive study completed by a team of toxicologists has shown that samples of farmed salmon from supermarkets across the U.S. have 10 times more residues of PCBs and dioxins than wild salmon. Dioxin is rated by every national and international agency as a proven human carcinogen. PCBs are rated as probable human carcinogens. I think the most dangerous thing is that exposure to these compounds before birth causes a reduction in IQ of the child. The smaller fish in this tank is a wild salmon at normal size for one year of age. The larger fish are the same age, but have been genetically modified to grow to harvest size in just half the time. About two-thirds of the shrimp consumed worldwide are caught in the ocean by shrimp trawlers, commercial vessels that drag heavy nets over the seafloor. This type of fishing gear also catches an immense volume of untargeted sea creatures. On average, worldwide, over five pounds of marine life are discarded for each pound of shrimp caught, and little of this so-called bycatch survives. There are some shrimp fishermen who try to reduce bycatch by using gear modifications called excluder devices. But not all nations that fish for shrimp take such precautions. Most of the world's shrimp farms are located in tropical countries, in developing nations like Thailand, where poverty can be widespread, where labor is low cost, and where environmental regulations are not the mangrove forest is a wetland habitat that has evolved over millions of years. With roots reaching directly into the sea, the trees protect one of the ocean's most important breeding grounds for many species of fish and shellfish. Large areas of Thailand's mangrove forests first fell to the charcoal industry. The expansion of shrimp aquaculture then furthered this decline. The Gulf Coast of Thailand is now home to thousands of shrimp farms. A welcomed step toward modern development for some, the end of a way of life for others. People who live in coastal fishing communities, from my experience in Southeast Asia, live quite a wonderful life. A great deal of independence in terms of what they do on a day-to-day basis. They go to sea, they catch fish, they mend their nets, they harvest a little bit of shellfish from the coastal area. They have access to a range of resources. They control their daily lives to a large extent. I'm not at all convinced that making them part of an industrial production system on a shrimp farm or shrimp processing plant represents a change for the better in the quality of life. The government gave leases to shrimp farmers and investor groups on coastal lands that were traditionally considered as public lands. Between 1976 and 96, the number of shrimp farms grew almost exponentially. There are now more than 30,000 shrimp farms in Thailand, and nearly all of this shrimp is exported to the U.S., Japan, and Europe. In the intensive approach to farming, to maximize production and profit, the ponds are stocked with very high densities. We had white spot virus infect our shrimp. There's no cure for it. 
So we had to harvest the stream early to cut our losses. A variety of antibiotics are available without prescription to most shrimp farmers in the developing world. These chemicals are added to the shrimp feed when a bacterial infection is suspected. So the wise use of antibiotics is an accepted and established practice. The same thing is true in, in aquaculture. The amount of antibiotics used in contrast, let's say, to, to poultry is substantially lower. Any time a practice takes place to prevent infection in animals or in fish or in shrimp, if that same antibiotic is used in humans in the active treatment of disease, that to me generally is a recipe for disaster. A growing number of scientists are concerned that the uncontrolled use of antibiotics can create disease-resistant bacteria that pose serious threat to humans. The immense volume of salt water released from the ponds, often carrying bacteria, viruses, and the chemicals used to control them, has contaminated freshwater aquifers that people depend on. One of the most magnificent fish ever to swim the open ocean is the giant bluefin tuna. They are apex predators, but they are also preyed upon. Bluefin tuna is the flagship species for extinction in the making. If any bony fish is going to go down, that is the one. At times, selling for tens of thousands of dollars each on the lucrative Japanese sushi market. Bluefin tuna is the most prized catch in the sea today. The focus of an international fishing effort that threatens to edge them closer to the brink of commercial extinction. The growing demand for sushi worldwide has also spawned a new form of aquaculture which critics say worsens the overfishing problem and poses a health risk to humans. Many marine scientists are also concerned that the immense quantity of fish needed to feed the tuna is unsustainable and threatens to disrupt sensitive ocean ecosystems. We're reaching the limits of the amount of small fish that we can extract and feed to, and feed to carnivorous fish like bluefin tuna. A very different type of aquaculture is feeding millions of people in China. Our marine resources are very limited now because of overfishing, and we have a huge population. It is by developing aquaculture that we can provide enough animal protein for our people. China is the birthplace of aquaculture, a well-integrated system that fits many of the principles of ecology. Modern day aquaculture in developed countries could learn a lot from the thousands of years of experience with aquaculture that comes from China. The fact that this very productive approach to fish farming has endured for so many centuries may be the ultimate measure for what can be defined as sustainable. And what they have evolved over time is a carp polyculture, where they have four types of carp in the same pond. And one species is, uh, feeds on phytoplankton, another one feeds on zooplankton, then there's a grass carp that feeds on vegetation that grows around the pond, and then there's a common carp, which is a bottom feeder and feeds on all the detritus from the other species of fish. So in terms of efficiency, this, this model's in a class by itself. Freshwater aquaculture in China is traditionally a part of their agriculture. Byproducts from various crops feed the fish, and waste products from the ponds fertilize the fields. A 
Another form of fish farming that's quite common in China is the production of shellfish, oysters and clams. They're grown in coastal regions in, in salt water and they filter the water and obtain their nutrients from that. And these are in environmental terms, the least intrusive of any of the farmed fish. In coastal waters of the Yellow Sea, vast shellfish beds are seeded with post-larval clams and... Taking huge quantities of wildlife from the ocean to turn these creatures into fish meal for farmed raised creatures. We don't know what we're doing. We're monkeying around with our life support system. We need to pull back and think about the, the logic of what are the appropriate candidates for aquaculture. Everything from oysters, mussels, clams, and appropriate fish that are plant eaters. Fortunately, China is not the only country growing fish and shellfish that are low on the food chain that don't need to be fed other fish. Tilapia is second only to carp as the most widely farmed freshwater fish in the world. Originally from the Nile River, it is an omnivore that can be raised almost entirely on plant-based proteins. <laughs> 